Hi, thanks for joining us. We're here to give a presentation on joint preservation through Henry Ford Health System. My name is Pat Strom and I'm a physical therapist assistant that will be here today to hopefully answer a few of your questions. What we do in this class is we review the knee and the hip in rather detail. We do not re review the shoulder as much because most of the time when you have arthritis in your shoulder, it's not arthritis. It's a frozen shoulder or a rotator cuff tear or a pinched nerve. So there is more information on one of our websites, which is www.henryford.com joints and that will give you more information specific for the shoulder exercises and information about it. One of the things I like to start the class with is what is osteoarthritis? Osteoarthritis is the connection of a bone is osteo, arthur is a joint, itis is inflammation. So any place in your body that you have a joint that has co coverage on the end of it and it can get inflamed and that's osteoarthritis. So doesn't matter where it is, if the two bones come together forming a joint, you can have arthritis. This class covers the, mostly the hip and a lot of the knee because it's a very easy joint to educate you with. But all these same precautions can go with any of the joints. So a little bit of the overview is we're going to try to find out the impact of arthritis and we're going to look at the anatomy of the knee and the hip and the pathology that causes it and how you get the diagnosis. We're going to cover a little bit of management of that joint. It's the activities, physical therapy, weight control, footwear, might touch a little on orthotics, nutrition, managing the pain and swelling, medications, experimental treatments, integrated medicine, and surgery. So how common is arthritis? Over 46 million Americans have arthritis. That's one in five adults. I think that these numbers may change as we, our population changes, but at this point we're looking at one in five adults. So it's a very common disease. It's the most, osteoarthritis is the most common form of arthritis. Osteoarthritis it causes pain, inflammation, and it leads to long-term disabilities. We're gonna have someone else come in and go over how arthritis is diagnosed and additional treatments and we're going to go from here. Hi, my name is Trevor Banka. I'm an adult reconstructive orthopedic surgeon through Henry Ford working out of West Bloomfield Hospital. Today we're going to be talking about osteoarthritis, how it's diagnosed and the causes. Osteoarthritis can be diagnosed in multiple different ways. We typically use an x-ray as our first line of, of radiography or first line of imaging. Through x-rays, what you're able to see is you can stage the arthritis and you can determine whether the hip or knee has uh, end stage arthritis or early changes which may be able to prevent uh, uh, advancement of the disease. Um, typically, the osteoarthritis that you see on x-ray uh, can be relatively mild. However, if you're still having hip or knee pain and that your physician or provider does not see changes on x-ray, sometimes, but not all the time, you might consider an MRI or magnetic resonance imaging in order to get more detail of the joint. There are also instances where you may need a blood test, and the, the blood test is to try to differentiate osteoarthritis from other forms of inflammatory arthropathies or inflammatory arthritis. So the hip and knee are both synovial joints. Synovial joints are a particular type of joint that have a synovial lining. Not all joints have synovial linings, like joints in your back. However, the hip and knee are both synovial joints. A synovial joint is one in such that has multiple different layers. And the layers of the joint, the outer layer is the joint capsule. It's a, it's a thick fibrous tissue that actually encapsulates the joint and keeps it watertight. On the inside of that, that, that capsule is a special very thin type of tissue called the synovial membrane or the synovium. The synovial membrane uh, produces fluid to lubricate the joint when the hip or knee flexes, flexes and extends. Inside of that is the, the end of the bones where it, the end of the bone is covered with cartilage. The synovial fluid produced by the synovial membrane lubricates the cartilage as the knee or hip flexes and extends. 
Here's a, a, a cartoon of the knee, and th these are the muscles that surround the knee. And you have your quadriceps muscle, which are the, the thigh muscles in the front of your, of your thigh. The hamstrings are the muscles in the backside of your, of your thigh. The quadriceps allow you to extend your knee. The hamstrings aid you in knee flexion. There's your gastrocnemius, which is the, the, the muscles which are behind the knee, which are really your calf muscles, which will allow you to um, uh, um, move your foot. And there's also um, hip and ankle muscles. That, that there's a, a few muscles that cross both your hip, and, uh, your hip and your knee, and muscles that cross your ankle and your knee. The muscles of the hip, there, you have multiple, multiple different mu muscle groups. The hip is the deepest joint in the body, and it, it too is a synovial joint, but it's also buried or encapsulated in, in muscle. There's multiple different layers. Those layers are, um, you have your, your gluteal muscles, and there's three layers of your gluteal muscles, and those are kind of your buttock muscles, or the muscles that allow you to uh, take your leg uh, to, to the side or move it away from your body. There's hip flexors, flexors, which allow you to flex your hip, hip extenders, which again allow you to extend your hip, and then small muscles, which will allow you to rotate your hip, which, uh, which really will rotate your entire lower extremity internally or externally. As you get deeper in, into the knee, the knee is made, up of, uh, is made up of three different bones. There's your femur or your thigh bone, your tibia or your shin bone, and then your patella or your kneecap. Um, the knee is, these are all uh, covered in cartilage, and cartilage is the thick substance on the end of the bone which allows you to, which allows you to fle flex and extend your knee, and that cartilage should be smoother than ice on ice. It's really the only frictionless surface known to man. It's, it's very remarkable. The knee also has some uh, stabilizers, and there's, there's two different types of stabilizers. There's static stabilizers and dynamic stabilizers. Your dynamic stabilizers are the muscles that we went over before. Your static stabilizers are your ligaments. There's four main ligaments in the knee. There's your collateral ligaments, which are uh, on the, on the uh, inside and outside of your knee, which, uh, which provides stability from, on side to side. There's your medial collateral and lateral collateral ligaments. And then there are your cruciate ligaments, or your ACL and PCL, which stand for anterior cruciate ligament and posterior cruciate ligament. And those aid in, in stability when the knee is flexed. And the stability is kind of that anterior posterior, or prevents your knee from sliding forward and back. So the cartilage on the knee is what we spoke of that should be, as that, as that knee flexes and extends, that cartilage should be smoother than ice on ice. And, it sh and the cartilage on the knee is about the thickness of, of an orange peel. Now once that cartilage becomes rough, that is arthritis or the roughening of cartilage. So once the cartilage becomes rough, no longer is it ice on ice, now it's sandpaper on sandpaper which is one, painful, and two, wears away even faster to the point where you may not have any cartilage on the bone. And that is the, that arthritic process or osteoarthritis, the wear and tear on the joint. As we get a little bit deeper in the knee, there are some, the, you have menisci as well. Menisci are specialized cartilaginous rings, which are in between the femur and the tibia, which really help distribute the force as, as you walk. It's very common to have uh, meniscal tears in an arthritic knee because if you think about the cartilage on the knee, as that cartilage, if it becomes rough, which is the arthritic process, the roughening of cartilage, if that cartilage becomes rough and it turns into sandpaper, that sandpaper is rubbing on a meniscus. If it rubs on the meniscus, that meniscus can start to fray. That's called a degenerative meniscal tear. That's a very common uh, tear to have in, in an osteoarthritic knee. It, the degenerative meniscal tear is far different than a traumatic meniscal tear, which you may see, say, a college athlete who makes a cut and has a traumatic meniscal tear. There are two different treatment options for that. Here's the basic anatomy of the hip. Again, it's a synovial joint, and what, what you're looking at on the cartoon, on the small cartoon on the, on the left, is that that's the thick joint capsule of the hip, and there's multiple different ligaments that make up the joint capsule. Those, again, create a watertight seal 
um, into the joint, and the joint is made up of the femoral head, which is the ball, and the acetabulum, which is the socket, and the hip is a ball and socket joint. So when you remove the ball and so when you remove the capsule, you, you're looking at the femoral head as well as the acetabulum. Both the femoral head and the acetabulum are both covered with cartilage. Again, it should be smoother than ice on ice as that ball rolls around in, in the socket. If that cartilage becomes rough, roughening of cartilage is osteoarthritis, then that can lead to uh, further damages where you can wear away the cartilage and bone on bone and pain. Again, cartilage is very important because it has multiple different uh, uh, functions. One, it'll, it, it, it covers and protects the ends of the bone and it absorbs the weight. It can absorb up to three times your body weight as you're, as you're ambulating or as you're walking. Um, once car cartilage is both avascular and aneural, meaning it does not have a blood supply and it does not have um, uh, uh, innervation or doesn't have nerves that go to it. So cartilage cannot regenerate itself. Once cartilage is lost, once it's damaged, it's damaged forever or it's lost forever. We, our body cannot regenerate it. So if you have, if you have damage to it if, it, if that cartilage starts to become rough, it's going to continue to wear. You can often think about this as um, the tread on your tires. The cartilage on your knee or hip is very similar to the tread on, your, uh, on the tires of your vehicle. If you, um, uh, it, the more you drive your vehicle, the harder you drive your vehicle, the faster you're going to wear away the tread on the tires. The only way to get new tread on your tires is to get new tires. Same with the cartilage on your knee. The harder you are on your joints, the more stress you put on your joints, the faster that that cartilage can wear away. The only way to get new, to get new cartilage on the knee is with a surgical procedure. So here's an example of a normal knee on the left uh, where you, you see very smooth cartilage. On the right is where you see that cartilage starting to wear away and become, and, and, and become rough. Not only once the cartilage becomes rough, what the, the, the pain in arthritis is caused by a couple different things. It's caused by inflammation and it's caused by the bone encountering more forces or more stress. The, the, the bone reacts to stress in different ways. The bone is innervated. It has a, a nerve supply and it can become painful. The cartilage breakdown products can create inflammation in that synovium that we talked about, which is the lining of the joint, and the inflammation in the synovium can become painful. Here's an example again of hip arthritis, where on the right you see a normal hip, where that femoral head is, is very smooth like a cue ball. On the left, the, the cartilage is beginning to wear down on the femoral head, and you can see wear on the acetabulum or the socket. This is what what we look at when, when, when we get an x-ray. we A healthy knee, you can see symmetric joint space both on, on both sides of the joint, on the medial side or the lateral side, and you see that the bone is very smooth and the bone has a very uniform appearance. The hallmark of an arthritic knee is loss of joint space, where you can see that those bones of the, of the end of the femur and the, the end of the tibia are close, they're touching. This is bone on bone arthritis or end stage arthritis. Not only that, but you can see a deformity forming of the knee where the knee is not aligned as you would expect it to in a normal joint. The bone also looks much more white or radio opaque is what we call it. And that's because the bone is seeing more forces. The bone, bone knows how to do one thing, form more bone. If it's seen more forces, it lays down more bone and tries to make, it the, make the end of the joint or the, the bone on the, in the joint very, very thick. So that's what we call sclerosis. Not only does it become thick, it can also form bone spurs. And bone spurs is, is the body's way of trying to distribute the force. So the hallmarks of arthritis are joint, loss of joint space, deformity, bone spurs, and you can, you, you can see um, cysts which can form in the bone as well. Here's a comparison of, uh, of an arthritic hip. Again, on the left, you can see adequate joint space or good joint space between the ball and the socket or between the femoral head and the acetabulum. On the right side, you see an arthritic hip, which you see loss of joint space. You see a deformity of the femoral head, which is it is no longer round. You can see a bone spur forming, which is the body's way of helping to, to, to distribute the force. 
Now I'm going to hand it off and we're going to talk about different treatment options for arthritis. Hi, my name is Sherry and I'm one of the physical therapists with Henry Ford Health System. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about self-management, so what can you do about your joint pain? So activity is very important for managing your joint pain. You should have an active lifestyle without making your pain worse. So you, for some people, this is going to mean that you have to increase your activity level. And for some people, that may mean that you need to decrease your activity level. Uh, you want to make sure that you're choosing activities and exercises that are kind to your joints and things that you're going to enjoy. You're definitely more likely to continue with something that you actually enjoy doing. Uh, joint pain and muscle soreness are not ex excuses for being inactive. You want to make sure that you find an activity that works for you and be consistent with it. Just doing it once in a while is not going to, to cut it. You have to be really consistent with it to actually see the effects. You will increase or keep your strength and flexibility by exercising and being active on a regular basis. This will also slow down the development and the progression of the osteoarthritis. Some exercise activity examples. Um, more mild activities would be like walking a couple miles in about a half an hour or so, so a 15 minute mile. Um, water aerobics, swimming, gardening, walking, bicycling, or therapeutic exercises such as what we would give you in physical therapy, um, a home exercise program of things that you can do at home. Um, some more moderate activities would be stair walking, um, washing and waxing a car, washing the windows, um, playing pickleball, playing other sports, biking, raking leaves, running, um, or pushing a stroller. So you want to make sure you talk to your doctor before you start an exercise program. Even the exercises that we are going to include in this program, uh, make sure that you talk to your doctor or talk to your therapist before getting started. You want to make sure to keep a positive attitude and not dwell on your pain. Your pain will make itself known whether you like it or not. Try to focus on other things. Uh, you want to make sure that you exercise regularly to help manage your pain. Uh, learn how to perform tasks in ways that are less stressful to your joints um, and that use correct posture to help your joints stay aligned properly. You want to make sure to listen to your body for signals that it needs rest and that it needs a good night's sleep. Some lifetime sports, some more hobby kinds of things that you could be doing. Walking, hiking, swimming, uh, golf, yoga, Pilates, ballroom or Middle Eastern dance or other kinds of dance. Um, tennis, other racket sports, biking, bowling, curling, canoeing, um, martial arts, especially Tai Chi, which works a lot on balance um, and core strengthening, cross-country skiing or snowshoeing, shoeing, sailing, any kinds of activities that you enjoy um, that are going to get you moving. Some precautions when you're doing your exercises. You want to avoid kneeling. And if you have knee pain, you already know this. You're not going to be doing that because it hurts. Um, avoid low chairs. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes toilets are low seats that people have difficulty with getting off of. There are things that you, you can buy um, to make your seat a little bit higher. Um, you can put a pillow on your chair to make that a little bit higher so you're not sitting quite so low. Um, avoid prolonged positions. Uh, we say motion is lotion, so you want to make sure to keep yourself moving at least every half an hour or so. Try to get your joints moving. And another thing is avoid twisting. A lot of people don't think about that part, um, but twisting is really hard on the joints. So um, when you're getting out of the car, for example, a lot of people like to do just the one leg at a time and try to get out. Instead of doing that, get both of your legs out of the car and then stand yourself up and then reverse the process when you're getting into the car. Sit yourself down and then swing both legs into the car. So you're avoiding that twisting motion. Um, some indications that you should stop doing an exercise. Uh, if the exercise causes sharp pain or throbbing pain, that's not what we're looking for. Uh, if the exercise causes joint swelling after you're done. Or if the ag exercise aggravates another injury or a co another condition that you have. You don't want to cause problems somewhere else because you're trying to fix one problem. Um, and another one would be if you're compromising your proper form in order to do the activity. We want to remember that quality over quantity. And we're going to go over some exercises that you can do at home, things that don't need equipment to do, um, but that can get you moving and get you stronger. 
So how can you make the most of your time exercising? You wanna make sure to talk to your doctor or your therapist before you start any exercise program. You wanna choose an activity that is kind to your joints. Breathe evenly during your exercises. Make sure that you're not holding your breath. Uh, all your muscles need that oxygen in order to perform well. Uh, you wanna make sure that you rest when you need to. If your body is telling you to rest, listen to it. Um, some muscle soreness and stiffness is normal at first, so expect that. Don't think that you're doing something wrong. Um, it's to be expected, but if it lasts more than a couple days, talk to your doctor. And you want to make sure that you're drinking plenty of water before, during, and after your exercise. Physical therapy can be a big part of maintaining um, your, your strength and helping with the pain. Um, you want to talk to your doctor about how to start physical therapy, getting a prescription for physical therapy. Some benefits of physical therapy, um, we can help with inflammation and pain. We use ice and heat, which can help to change your circulation. Uh, we use ultrasound, electrical stimulation to help with pain. Um, we use hands-on technique, techniques, manual therapy kinds of things where we're actually physically um, doing something to you to help with the pain. Um, Pool workouts, we do a lot of guided therapeutic exercise where we, we're specifically telling you that these are the exercises that you can do and this is how you do it and make sure that you um, are doing things properly. Um, and then we do a lot of training to return to work, sports, uh, recreation activities, or we can also work on fixing walking patterns. Sometimes it's just the way that you're built and there's not a whole lot we can do to change it. But sometimes there's something small that we can change about the way that you walk and if you multiply that by however many steps you take in a day, it can make a big difference. Some manual therapy kinds of things that we do. Uh, we do manual stretching where I would be stretching a muscle for you. Joint mobilization where I am actually physically moving your joint um, and that can help with pain relief and get the joint moving better. And then soft tissue mobilization, so um, massage kinds of things. Um, some more therapeutic exercise things that we work on. We work on your range of motion, getting the joint to move as far as what it can. Uh, we stretch the muscles. We work on strengthening the muscles. We work on balance and proprioception. Proprioception um, is a, um, it's a way your body tells you where you are in space. So you have sensors in your body that tell you, oh, you're leaning forwards, you better lean back, that kind of thing. And sometimes that can get thrown off when your um, joints are not... Um, supported the way that they need to be. Uh, we work on endurance and we work on agility. Some more functional kinds of things that we work on, we work on activities of daily living, so getting dressed, bathing, those kinds of things that you don't even really think about until now all of a sudden you can't bend your knee far enough to put on your socks or to wash your foot or those kinds of things. And so we can um, help you with different ways to do things or if there's um, equipment or a tool that you need to be able to get the job done. Uh, we work on transitional movements, so rolling in bed. What's the easiest way to do that? What's the easiest way to get in and out of bed or the healthiest way? Um, what's the best way to go from sit to stand? Um, and working through those kinds of things that you may have difficulty with doing. We work on gait training, so um, working on how you walk. And then return to work, sport, and recreation. Uh, will weight control help with osteoarthritis? Absolutely. If you are overweight, you can reduce the pressure on your knees by losing weight. So a loss of 10 pounds reduces pressure on your knees by 50 pounds of when you're using the steps or when you're getting in and out of a chair. So it can make a big difference. It doesn't mean that you have to lose 50 pounds. Every pound that you lose takes pressure off of your knees. Um, and there is a Henry Ford weight management program. Uh, to join the program, you must have a body mass index of 30 or more, and you have to have a referral from your doctor. Footwear can also make a big difference in your joint health. You want to make sure to look for shoes with good cushioning and good arch support so that your alignment is as good as possible starting from the ground up and so that you have cushion for your joints as you, with each step that you take. So if you have flat feet or high arches, you may, may benefit from um, some orthotics, which are inserts that you put in your shoe and then they um, try to change the alignment of your foot. Uh, talk to your therapist or talk to your doctor about the pricing of custom orthotics or over-the-counter orthotics. Some other devices that can help 
Um, knee braces, we get a lot of question about knee braces. Should, we wear, should I wear a knee brace? Does it help? What kind of knee brace? Those kinds of questions. Um, and the one thing that I will tell you about knee braces is that it has to be worn correctly. If you're not wearing the brace correctly, it's not going to do its job. So you need to make sure that it's aligned correctly on your knee. Um, and you may need um, the person who gives you the, the brace to do that to show you how to do it, or your, your therapist could help you with that too. Uh, but make sure that you have it on correctly. Um, and you also want to make sure that you're only wearing it just for what you need it for. So you're not going to just automatically wear it all day long, unless that's what your doctor has told you to do. Um, but the idea of a brace is to get you through what you need it to. So if you know that going to the grocery store, for instance, really aggravates your knee pain, wear it when you go to the grocery store. But then when you're done, take it off so that your muscles truly have the chance to work and stabilize your knee instead of relying on that brace to do it for you. Um, we also work with different assistive devices so we can guide you towards um, what assistive device might be best for you. Do you need to use a cane? Do you need to use a walker? Uh, what kind of walker? What kind of cane? There's all kinds of options so we can guide you in that and also making sure that you um, have it fit properly for you. Some other equipment, um, raised toilet seats. Like I said, toilets can be notoriously low seats to sit on, um, so raising that up a little bit can help. Um, grab bars in the shower, a shower chair, if you have trouble for standing for long enough in the shower, uh, having a place to sit so that you're um, safe and not painful with all the standing. And now I'm going to turn it over to someone else to talk about some nutrition kinds of things. Good afternoon, I'm Colleen Matz, a PTA here at Henry Ford Health System, and I'm going to be um, sharing with you some nutritional tips that can help aid with um, the osteoarthritis that you are suffering from. So some of the nutritional tips that we want to talk about first off is cutting calories. Um, you want to always think about your portion sizes and trying to choose smaller portion sizes, avoiding sugary foods um, and sh foods and drinks. Um, especially like when you think about going to restaurants, you want to make sure that they tend to like give you almost two or three portions of food. Try to like cut those portions or maybe take them home for leftovers. Um, another thing to think about is how much fruits and vegetables you're getting. Fruits and vegetables are really important. You want to make sure they're taking up a portion of your plate. Um, antioxidants in fruits and vegetables may help joint inflammation, help reduce joint inflammation and pain. You should consume a minimum of three cups of vegetables and two cups of fruit each day. So you want to always be looking at your plate and making sure that you have those on there with every meal if possible. Um, all fruits and vegetables can contribute to improved health, especially um, cherries, leafy greens, tomatoes, and berries, which are all high in antioxidants. Um, another thing to think about is choosing um, Foods that have omega-3 fatty acids, the benefits of omega-3 fatty acids um, help with stiffness and joint pain. They help reduce inflammation um, and help anti-inflammatories work. Uh, food sources can be cold water fish such as salmon, mackerel, herring, and tuna. They are also found in flaxseed and walnuts. Sometimes you can get flaxseed ground down. You can add it to smoothies or yogurt. It just makes it a little easier to take down. Also, another thing that sometimes gets overlooked is making sure that you're hydrated and that you're drinking plenty of water. This also is something to think about is making sure that you're not intaking too much caffeine. So with waters and teas, if you're having more than one to two cups a day, that will affect your hydration levels and you wanna always be really careful with that. So make sure you're getting plenty of water. Um, another thing that you really wanna make sure that you're avoiding is highly processed foods um, that are high in sugar or sugary drinks. Uh, things that have animal fat and refined grains. Uh, these can add a lot of extra calories into your meals, um, and these foods do not add any nutritional benefit or value at all. They often lead to weight gain. Um, something that you can also think about when you're going to the grocery store is um, something I like to kind of let people know is you want to try to shop on the outside or the perimeter of the store. That's where you're going to find more of your produce, and your meats and your dairies and try to avoid the inside aisles of the grocery store where you're going to often find those processed foods. Thank you very much for your time and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Amy. Hello, my name is Amy Hahn. I'm one of the physical therapist assistants here at Henry Ford um, and I'm here to bring you some additional tips uh, regarding nutrition and other tips for helping manage your pain and swelling. Um, you could visit our website 
there's a health and wellness blog that you can sign up for. It provides recipes and other helpful tips on eating healthy and staying fit. Um, you can also sign up to receive the latest articles in your inbox every week. There's also a grocery store tour that you could sign up for for a small fee of $15. Uh, which a registered dietitian nutritionist will take small groups on a tour throughout the grocery store and teach you how to select your food items and how to shop smarter to buy the most nutritious foods. Also, we have nutrition services where you can meet one-on-one -on -one with a registered dietitian um, or, and learn about other nutrition services. Some other tips to decrease pain and swelling are rest. So you want to avoid activities that cause pain after a new injury or any flare-up of a chronic injury, so something that you've had for a while. Um, I know I have a lot of patients in the past that say, you know, when I go up and down stairs to do laundry, my knee after a while starts to really bother me. So my suggestion is to split those activities into smaller portions. Um, if you know that 15 minutes of going up and down stairs bothers your knee or your hip, break it into smaller portions. Uh, also, you can elevate and compress the joint or the painful area. Elevating the in injured area above the level of your heart helps gravity pull some of the inflammation back down into the system to be filtered out. Um, you could also try wearing compression sleeves or stocking over your swollen joint. You could combine those things and elevate it with the rest and add ice to the factor. Ice helps decrease pain after an injury uh, if there's swelling and can prevent future swelling. You want to use ice after a new injury. So anything that's happened within the last 72 hours typically will require some ice. Uh, you could also try heat to relieve stiffness or pain that's not from an injury over your muscles. Uh, the heat should never be used within that 72 hours of a new injury as it could actually increase the inflammation. Um, or if you have a lot of swelling in that joint, you're not going to want to put heat on it. You would rather, you should use the ice. You can use both ice and heat um, in certain instances. If you have a chronic low back pain or a chronic hip pain and you know that that hot water really helps you feel better, you know, take a warm shower in the morning, help get your body loosened up get the blood flowing, get the muscles a little more limber, and start your day. Um, you, or you could do the exercises after that. Then after your activities or at the end of your day, uh, try applying ice to that joint just to help undo all of the activities of the day to kind of calm everything down and allow them to rest. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague to talk about some medicines and other things that you can do to manage your pain. Hi, I'm Mike Charters, one of our joint replacement specialists at Henry Ford. I specialize in the uh, non-surgical and surgical treatment of hip and knee arthritis and hip and knee replacement surgery. And I'm here to talk today about the medical and surgical treatment of hip and knee arthritis. So in terms of medical treatment, it's important to first talk to your, doc uh, your doctor before taking any medicines or starting any new treatments. They'll review your allergies, health conditions, and make sure that you're on medicines that are right for you. So in terms of the medical treatment of arthritis, I divide the treatment options into uh, five main categories. Uh, medicines, uh, injections, which are some of the things that I'm gonna talk about right now. Um, we, there are three other medical treatments that we talked about earlier, exercise, um, using a, an assistive device like a cane or a brace and weight loss, and those are also important. Um, in terms of the medicines, there are pain relievers such as Tylenol. There are uh, NSAID medications, also known as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as ibuprofen, naproxen. Uh, those medicines, we have to be careful about your stomach and kidneys, uh, and it's important to talk to your uh, doctor before starting one of these medicines. Supplements like glucosamine or chondroitin. The uh, studies on these medications, the research is mixed. Uh, some patients find benefit. Not all patients find benefit, uh, but there are definitely patients that swear by these medicines and they're pretty inexpensive. And I say that if they work for your 
uh, hip or knee arthritis, then I would, I would take them. There's also injections. There are different uh, types of injections. There's uh, steroid injections that you'll hear about. There's uh, lubricant injections. There's uh, PRP or stem cell um, biologic type injections. The two most common types are steroid and the lubricant injections. The steroid injections are also known as glucocorticoids and those medicines are a very strong anti-inflammatory that we inject directly into the affected joint and that is like putting a medicine like Motrin or Aleve directly into the affected joint and helps decrease the inflammation and, and help with your arthritis pain. There's also visco supplementation, also known as lubricant injections, and those medicines can also help improve your arthritis symptoms and decrease pain. Many of those lubricant injections are, are done as a series of three to five um, injections over a few weeks, and they work about as well as the steroid injections in general in most studies. There are also biologic um, therapies which are experimental for the treatment of arthritis, such as PRP or platelet-rich plasma and stem cells. These types of injections, again, they're experimental. Uh, they're not shown in um, good research studies to show uh, benefit in the treatment of arthritis, and we do not recommend them for the treatment of arthritis at this time. Many of these injections are, are not covered by insurance, and uh, there is some out-of-pocket cost. There are also treatments through integrative medicine, such as Henry Ford's Center for Integrative Medi Medicine Services, where they offer things such as acupuncture, chiropractics, massage, and Reiki, and through Wellspring services, such as massage, Reiki, yoga, and things like that. In terms of the surgical treatment of arthritis, Let's first look at the surgical treatment of knee arthritis. The first option listed here is arthroscopy or a camera surgery where we would go into the knee with a small a camera and instruments and clean up the knee. This procedure is not something that we do very often for the treatment of arthritis. It's typically used in uh, patients who have isolated um, injuries of the knee that are not associated with arthritis. Osteotomy is another surgical option. This is uh, uh, an option where we actually cut the bone and realign the bone in cases where patients have a significant bow leg or knock knee. And by improving the alignment, we can change how the force is transferred between the bones and unload an arthritic area of the knee and transfer the force to a normal area of the knee. This is a pretty specific option that um, is an option for some patients but not as commonly used today with improvements in knee replacement technology. Knee replacement is divided into two categories. There's total knee replacement and partial knee replacement. When you look at the types of knee replacement, you have to take a step back and look at the anatomy of the knee. The knee is divided into three compartments. There's the inside compartment, the outside compartment, and in the front. And if you have arthritis in just one of those three compartments, then you can consider a partial knee replacement where we just resurface one third of the knee. If you have arthritis in more than one compartment, then we talk about doing a total knee replacement where we would resurface the entire knee. And so those are the differences between the two. And I'm gonna show you uh, on the x-ray and the models here what each option looks like. So this is a model of a total knee replacement. On this, you can see what a total knee replacement is. A total knee replacement is when we resurface the ends of the bones 
with metal, and there's a piece of plastic in between. In this model, you see these ropes simulate the ligaments in your knee. When you look at it from the side, you can see what I mean when I say a resurfacing, where you see the metal resurfacing the end of the femur bone, the thigh bone, and resurfacing the top of the tibia bone, the shin bone. And then when you look at it from the front, you see the plastic in between. And by resurfacing the knee with the metal and plastic parts, it takes away all the arthritis from the knee, and all of your arthritis pain will be gone. What I also want to show you now is the x-ray of the knee. You can see on the left side is a view from the front of what the knee replacement looks like on x-ray. The bright white is the metal components resurfacing the end of the bones. And on the right side, you see the, um, the side view of the knee. And on the side view, you can see very well what, what we mean by a resurfacing, where you see how that metal component simply recaps the end of that top bone, the femur bone, and resurfaces the top of the bottom bone, the, the, uh, the tibia bone. And then you also, on the side view, see the kneecap in the front. And in many situations, we also resurface the back of the kneecap too, taking away all the arthritis from the knee. So this is a, a picture of a partial knee replacement. On the left image, you can see the, the most left image is of the patient's arthritic knee, where only one third of the knee is affected with arthritis. And on the, the second image, the after image, is the one showing the partial knee replacement, where that arthritic area of the knee has now been resurfaced with metal, with the plastic piece in between. And then the rightmost image is the x-ray of the patient's knee, uh, showing the bright white metal components of the partial knee replacement and uh, the uh, restored alignment of the, of the knee. So in terms of the surgical treatment of hip arthritis, the first option listed here is arthroscopy, where we would go in and with a camera clean up the hip joint. This is not something that we commonly do in the treatment of hip arthritis. Uh, this camera surgery is usually more limited to a sports injury or something like that. Uh, there are also um, hip osteotomies, which are not very common for the treatment of hip arthritis. That's a, again, an osteotomy is where we would go and we would cut and realign either the socket or the, the ball um, of the hip to try to offload the arthritic area with a normal area of the joint. And again, this is not something that is commonly done in the treatment of hip arthritis. Then there is total hip replacement surgery, which is a good surgery for the treatment of arthritis. It's where we would go in and we would resurface the hip with a new metal socket and a new uh, typically ceramic ball. And by replacing the hip with ceramic, plastic, and metal, we take away all of your hip arthritis and all of your hip arthritis pain will be gone. So this is a model of a total hip replacement. Before we talk about the total hip replacement, we should first talk about some anatomy of the hip. The hip is a ball and socket joint. And when you look at the hip, the first thing we do in a hip replacement is we replace the socket. The socket is typically uh, replaced with a metal component. It has a very rough surface on the back. And when we place it into the patient's socket, that gets a very tight fit in the bone. And then the patient's bone heals into that, forming a long-term biologic bond. The socket is lined with a plastic liner, and that liner is made of a very wear-resistant plastic that lasts a very long time. And then we look at the ball side. The ball so side consists of two components. There's the ball, and then there's a stem. The stem goes down the patient's femur. The femur is hollow, and it just goes down the hollow part of the femur. And then the ball is made out of ceramic and, or, or metal. And by resurfacing the hip with ceramic, plastic, and metal, we take away 
all of the arthritis and all of the ar patient's arthritis pain will be gone. This shows an x-ray of what the hip replacement looks like, and you can see uh, the socket that has been placed into the patient's pelvis and the uh, stem that goes down the femur bone, and that is attached to the new ball. And uh, this gives you a new ball and socket, and now all the arthritis is gone. In this video, we talked about the non-surgery and surgery treatments for arthritis of your hip or knee. The non-surgery treatments are five, medicines, injections, exercise, weight loss, and the use of assistive devices. You consider a surgery when those options, you've tried some of those and they're no longer working and you're not able to do the things that you enjoy. The surgical options, um, typically a joint replacement surgery, um, those would resurface the hip or knee with metal or plastic parts taking away all of your arthritis and all of your arthritis pain. At this point, you could follow up with your physician to talk about these options. And if you're interested in learning more at Henry Ford, you can go to henryford.com joints for more information or call 1-800-HENRY-FORD or 313-916-2181 to make an appointment to discuss hip or knee replacement surgery. Thank you for your time today. I hope that you uh, enjoyed and uh, learned from our informational video. We look forward to seeing you at Henry Ford.